Hey, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'll be talking with Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com. We'll talk about some of the charts that he's focusing on. The S&P, the major averages, continuing to distribute after yesterday's big drop in the major averages. The Nasdaq down about 3%, continue to push lower through the course of the day today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a snowy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really designed to help you navigate the markets in uncertain times, help you focus not on what could happen or what should happen, but what actually is happening by focusing on the messages embedded in price and breadth and sentiment. Today, we're going to look in a little more detail at some of the major averages, focus on some key levels to pay attention to. I'm excited to have Dave Landry on the show today. As a uh, simple trading system, we've talked about looking at the S&P uh, 500. You'll see what's happened now as we've uh, as we've pulled back. It's changed the look a little bit. As we've seen breadth conditions deteriorate, as we've seen some individual names pull back, is this the beginning of something deeper and more sinister? We'll see what the charts tell us today. Let's move right on to our market recap We'll start off looking at the major averages and what happened. Uh, as I mentioned, sort of distribution through the course of the day. At the end of the day, the S&P really not moving a ton. Uh, you know, overall netting into a negative 0.1, but overall kind of chopping around. And if you look, the sell-off yesterday was kind of like the big meal or... I guess a better a better analogy would be the puking up of, of a meal, maybe. But then you can see today is sort of the digestion day, right? Sort of the consolidation. So yesterday's the big move. Today's sort of all about processing that and sort of seeing what's happened. So we've been in an equilibrium, sort of above and beyond, uh, or above and around 4,039, uh, 39.95 or so. And that's about where we uh, ended the day today. NASDAQ up a little bit, but not by much. Uh, just about uh, uh, just above zero for the NASDAQ 100 mid caps and small caps both up a, a token amount as well. The VIX back lower. This is after the VIX spiked higher, uh, getting above 23 yesterday, pulling back a little bit, uh, but uh, but settling in in the uh, in the high 22s. Interest rates moving lower through the course of the day. So yesterday you had rates moving higher pretty aggressively as bond prices were selling off. Today bond bonds sort of found a footing and yields came off a little bit. That's what you know sort of prevented, I would argue, uh, risk assets from really plunging any further today. The dollar index up about a third of a percent. Commodities mostly in the red, particularly gold and silver, uh, down 0.6 and 1.6 percent respectfully. Oil prices uh, down as well. The only uh, the only one that was up was natural gas. The UNG was a uh, up on the day. But for the most part, commodities continue to feel some weakness. And as I was scanning for stocks making new uh, three-month lows today, a lot of gold stocks, a lot of uh, like Agnico and other names that we've uh, we've highlighted as being in strong phases earlier uh, here recently, now rotating higher, just like gold prices kind of coming off their recent swing highs. You're seeing deterioration in, uh, in a lot of those names, Newmont and others in the uh, gold mining space. Cryptocurrencies, for the most part, kind of continuing the deterioration we talked about in the show yesterday, along with other risk assets rolling over a little bit to the downside. Uh, Ethereum prices uh, just about 1620 and Bitcoin pushing below 24,000 through the course of the day today, currently around 23,840. Let's look briefly at a daily chart of the S&P 500. When we've talked about this chart recently, it's been a lot of trend lines we focused on, right? Uh, up until sort of mid-January and going into the end of last month, we talked about this big green trend line, which connected the highs through the course of 2022. We tested that line five or six more times and then finally break, broke through it in, uh, in mid-January. That, in my opinion, was one of the great sort of indications of what we call a change of character, right? A rotation from a distribution phase to an accumulation phase. Now that thesis starts to become under pressure because now we're at the lower end of a channel kind of coming up here. And so, you know, the question mark is, do we find a footing here? Do we make a another higher low like we did in December? Do we make a higher low uh, here in uh, late February, setting the stage for the next move higher? If so, there are plenty of kind of logical, technical places for that to happen. 
Right about now would be an interesting point because that's how you uh, connect the lows from October and the low from early January. That lines up pretty well with today's low. So holding current levels right about the 50-day moving average might be an important uh, point. If we break below that 39.40, that's the 200-day moving average. And if you draw a trend line using the closing prices, the slope's a little uh, lower and it kind of ends up around 39.40, 39.50. So we're kind of right at that point. If you would ask me to pinpoint if this is a viable dip before the next move higher. That's kind of where I'd probably focus on, somewhere between here and the December lows around 3,800. Uh, but that's a big question mark. We'll have to see what the charts actually tell us. And what we're seeing through the course of this week so far, generally, I would say, is more of a risk-off uh, a move. Today, you did see some sectors finishing in the green. Yesterday, everything in the red uh, moving lower from really bad to kind of bad. Today, a little more nuanced. With material stocks up about 0.7%, the XLY, which is consumer discretionary, up half a percent. Communication services also positive, but only by about 0.2%. The underperformers today, some defensive sectors like real estate and utilities, and then energy down 0.6%. And another uh, you know, sort of point as I was scanning for stocks making um, new swing lows, a lot of energy coming up on my list. And, and what I usually look at is, is what's making a new three-month low this week is kind of the general way that I, I construct my scans. A bunch of energy stocks, a lot of exploration and production, what we call the ENP names like uh, Apache and uh, Chesapeake and Devon Energy, DVN, uh, Occidental. These are all names that are sort of making a new swing low here uh, this week. Apache is an interesting one, gapping below the 200-day moving average, which is uh, which is kind of uh, kind of an important level to pay attention to. Let's look briefly at a couple other charts here uh, before we uh, head into the break. Uh, going to the Mindful Investor Live chart list, I did want to highlight this one. We had this as one of our three and three charts yesterday, I want to say, or the day before, I forget. Uh, but basically, this is the percent of stocks above key moving averages. Here we have the S&P at the top. We have the percent of stocks above their 200-day as of today's close, just above 62%. So generally, two out of three S&P names still holding their 200-day moving average, just like the S&P is. That's pretty constructive. And as long as that holds above 50%, I would argue that sort of that medium-term trend is probably still in good shape, right? That breaks below 50%, uh, then that tells you that it might be something a little more significant. Because what that illustrates is that over half of the S&P names would have then be, uh, be, have broken down through their 200-day moving average. That really usually only happens during a retrenchment, during a, bear, uh, a bearish uh, move, a down move of some sort that's significant enough that stocks are unable to hold their 200-day. So I think that would, for me, start to differentiate between sort of a garden variety, buyable pullback potentially versus something a little more significant where you really have to think about downside risk management. Now, in the uh, you know not so great list, I would add this particular indicator, which is uh, the fact that less than half of the S and P now uh, remain above their 50-day moving average. Now, we're kind of right at that point. We're right about at 50%. To be honest, this is where we hit in late December. We bounced above there. We pulled back again to this level in mid-January and rotated higher. You can see the times looking back when we hold that 50% level, and you can see the times when we don't. And the real difference is the times when we don't hold this 50% level, don't remain above here, it's more of a negative trend, right? Because most stocks are now below their 50-day. Most stocks are moving lower in the short term, and that's putting uh, quite a weight on the major averages. So this indicator right at kind of that key level to watch right at 50%, can it hold this? Do we get enough of a bounce that this doesn't get uh, much lower uh, below current levels? The other one would be the percent of their 200 days still actually in the bullish category, nearing where we bottomed out in December, which I think was one of the great bullish tells going into uh, the beginning of this year. Um, you know, it's interesting when you look at charts like ARC, and I'm thinking of some of these uh, some of these names that have had big uh, big runs off of the lows. When you think about ARC's performance year to date. Pretty impressive, right? Going from a low around 30 to where we're at currently around 40. That's a decent rally of about 30 some percent off of the lows. But let's remember, we're still way below the levels we were a year ago, a year and a half ago, right? So we still have much ground to, uh, to make up. But now what's happening is you sort of have what I would call a uh, potential bullish pennant pattern. And if you're not familiar with what I just said, here's what I mean. A bullish pennant is where you have a run higher, like you did with ARC off of the lows. Then you have this short-term pattern. Uh, let me get a color that's actually viewable. There we go. You have a, a big run higher, 
call that the flagpole. Then you have the lower highs and higher lows. And that's sort of a consolidation period. What this basically is telling you is the market's agreeing that ARC is worth around $41 a share. And what we did is we overshot it and then undershot it, overshot it, undershot it. We're kind of clustering right around that equilibrium level. And what's interesting about this sort of pattern is one of two things is going to happen. Either we break to the upside or we break to the downside, right? This this pattern, this consolidation is going to hit a natural end called the apex, right? Where the two lines come together. So usually about two thirds to three quarters of the way through. That's what I remember John Murphy teaching me. We wait to see which way it breaks. Do we break below the lower boundary or above the upper boundary? That might tell us a lot of what we need to know about the next steps for some of these speculative and emerging technology names included in something like the ARK Innovation Fund. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Dave Landry. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, guys, welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Dave Landry. First off, we're going to do a mailbag segment at the end of this week. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. You can reach us via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe to it while you're there and put a question below the video you're watching. We'll hope to answer one of your questions live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming guests, excited to bring Dave Landry on here in a few moments. Tomorrow on Thursday, February 23rd, we have Louis Giannis, who's a financial advisor based in Colorado at WealthNet Advisors. Next week on Tuesday, February 28th, uh, joining us for the first time, Chris Verone. Chris is a CMT. I've known Chris and his work for a long time as the head of technical research at Strategus Research Partners, which has a wide following in the institutional community. Really interested to see what charts he is thinking about and talking to his institutional clients about. He'll be on the show February 28th, Tuesday of next week. I want to welcome on today's guest, Dave Landry. Dave's the founder of DaveLandry.com. Just recently landed back home in New Orleans yeah. and uh, joining us on the show. Dave, it's great to see you. Welcome back. Great to be back. Great to be back. Your timing is everything, and you timed your arrival in time for our show uh, impeccably well. So congrats on that. Hopefully you. your market timing is equally as successful as your uh, as your aviation timing. We're starting with your weekly chart of the S&P 500. This is a sort of simple trend following model we talked about on your last appearance. Can you explain what it is and update it, what it's, uh, what it's telling us now? Yeah, this is a simple little system I developed to focus mostly on keeping you out of bad markets. And, and that's sort of the secret of of trading, as you know. And I, I believe with technical analysis, it should be performance-based and mm -hmm. not some mumble jumbo or whatever. So uh, it, it can't get much simpler than this. Uh, once the market drops below a 50-week closing high and the 50-week closing uh, moving average, you get out. And that's that's pretty much the whole system. The, the entry is a little bit more stringent. You need two bars of Landry Light, or as you call them, a gap above the moving average, which we had last week. And you also need to close above the, the buy line or the 10% line, which uh, we did not have last week. And then this week we come right back in. Usually you bring me on a show and the market just tanks. So uh, <laughs> that might be a good that might be a good trading system. We'll have to figure that out. The, the new platinum level uh, research service you and I will provide. We'll share ahead of yeah. time when you're going to come on the show. So people could be prepared. So just to review what you were saying, right? And I remember we talked about this last time. This is this line here in uh, in green. This is part of your uh, ACP plugin. I know people can access. And Absolutely. it's the percent off the closing high. And it's a I think it's a 10% off the closing high, right? 50 week. Yeah, that's correct. If the, you can look yeah. at the parameters on the, le on the left-hand side. So it's 90% of the high. And then it's 50, and that's a 50 simple moving average for that. Got it. So a 50 period look back just to make right. sure. And you have so it, it inadvertently, I didn't realize it would take so long to get back in, but that works out really well when you have a longer term process bottom like we're having now, but it just it just keeps processing. <laughs> so 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 that it makes a ton of sense, and we've certainly seen some weakness here, uh, you know, through the course of this week so far, Dave. When you're looking at um, sort of the daily chart of the S and P 500. What are you seeing in terms of key levels? I mentioned in the market recap, kind of looking at a trend line off of the lows, you know, moving average support were right there. Are there key levels that you're seeing on the way down that would give you some confidence that this is some sort of viable dip, or do you think it's sort of lights out, get defensive at this point? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw in a towel just yet. But once, hmm. once we get a little further down than we are now, in fact, even where we are now, I would remain cautious. And I used to uh, do technical analysis for a hedge fund years ago. And whenever Mark would break out and come back into the chop, he called it the soup. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of where we are now. We're kind of back in the soup once again, just a just a few weeks ago. In fact, even last week, we were, we were above the breakout levels and just kind of hanging in there. So all this scores is a bit of a bummer. 
as you know, the markets will often do what they have to do to frustrate the most. <laughs> and what they might be doing now, and, and I hate to use the word hope, but I'm hoping that we're just getting kind of a shakeout move. And you mentioned earlier uh, the VIX. The VIX is getting stretched. Anytime the closing VIX is 10% or more above the 50, uh, I'm sorry, the 10 simple moving average, the market tends to pop in the opposite direction. So I'm looking for an intraday pop. I'm looking to play that, but uh, out further than one day, I, I would remain cautious to, with the overall market. And what you do is just be very selective in your setups and make sure you're waiting for entries. And that's one thing that, that has kept us out of a lot of trouble and, and kind of bored the clients to death. <laughs> so I've, I've often told something. people, sometimes this should be boring if you're doing it right. It shouldn't, yeah, shouldn't exactly. always take uh, action, right? Your second chart, AI certainly has been in a lot of the conversations recently in, in news quite a bit here. We're looking yeah. at a particular stock, ticker AI, it's C3.AI. Uh, Can you talk us through this chart, how you're approaching it? Yeah, this is crazy volatile, just uh, buyer beware, but it, you have a nice Landry light above the 30 EMA nights. It's been above the 30 for a long time, and that's one of my favorite moving averages. And then we had a pullback. It tried to rally out of the pullback. And you see where it got up to about 27.50 and then came back in. So I think that little fake out is actually a positive thing. I actually call it a trend pivot pullback. And if mm. it takes out, let's say, 27.50, it would require a tremendously wide stop. And, and we're just trying to get a swing trade out. And then hopefully, there's that word again, but hopefully ride the trend for a longer term trend on the remainder of the position. But I would I would have the stop maybe a little bit below that 30. So you're looking at about a, about a 10 point stop now. Percentage wise, that's huge, but huge. But what you do is just bring your share size down accordingly. So you're not trading as many shares. And mm. I've done a lot of work over the years where volatility is your friend, but you have to respect it by trading it at a smaller size. Um, you know, I realize as I'm looking at this, I don't have the uh, the Landry Light indicator on here. I'm going to add it very quickly. But but while we're here and you're, you mentioned it a couple of times, can you just explain briefly what that is and why you keep referring to what and i and i i would describe it as it's it's counting how many bars or how many days we right. remain yeah, it's, with it's space, counting right? how many bars and lows are above the moving average and if you could change that to a 30 ema while i talk through it uh yeah that would just it would fit the chart so sure. what it, it's just a very simple way of 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 showing where the, whether or not you have a trend if it's flipping back back and forth between red and green then there is no trend but once you get about 10 or so bars of the, the Landry light, as I call it, it, it means that the market might be beginning to trend, but you also still want to look at the chart and look at the net net uh, performance based type of type of technical analysis, as you and I were discussing right before the show, make sure that it's actually moving higher in addition to what the indicator is showing. And, and I often call indicators illustrators because they're not indicating anything. They're telling you what's already in the chart, but they can help illustrate what's already in the chart so you can see it more clearly. And as you know, seeing what is is important when it comes to trading off the charts. When I'm looking at this chart, it reminds me of the uh, of the arc chart I had up a little bit ago um, during the market recap, talking about sort of this pennant sort of pattern. It looks like AI has a similar sort of thing. Do you subscribe to that pattern? Do you think think this is sort of a consolidation phase? And uh, and and if so, what would you be looking for to be sort of an all in? This is a constructive setup here. I think arc looks pretty good at this juncture, yeah. and, it, and the patterns are similar, as you said. You've got a nice uh, kind of bottom out pattern. It, it's rallied nicely off the lows. One thing I was thinking about as you were uh, doing the show earlier is that I think that the manager of this fund put a whole bunch of money into Bitcoin. So I think we might be seeing a little bit of a pop with the ARC through Bitcoin. Now, what I'll do with ARC is I'll trade it intraday and I'll trade SARC for shorting it. And then if I want to go after Bitcoin, I'll just go after Bitcoin. Right. So but try yeah, to uh, try to focus your bets. And, and that's a great, great comment. Buyer beware, like have awareness of what actually is in some of the funds that you're looking at. Your your third uh, chart getting uh, segueing into cryptos. This yeah. is a cryptocurrency we talked about last time. Uh, one of the altcoins, if I remember right. Can you update us on what you're seeing now? It's pulling back a little bit along with other cryptocurrencies today. Yeah. Right? yeah. And as you alluded to earlier or mentioned earlier, crypto is kind of getting hit a little bit in here. But it's had a pretty good run. I mean, some of these things that I'm in have gone up 100% overnight. And, you know, down 100% too, but uh, that's another story. But what we're talking about here is it was basing nicely. And then I was basically saying, wait for a breakout. I'm not a huge breakout player, but if you get in a market like crypto that gets really hot, or if we get another 1999, then you could go after pretty much anything that's going straight up. And what's interesting is that it did break down below the base and then take out took out the base to the upside. And that'll actually test out. I, I don't trade that in and of itself. 
but it's a nice kind of backing or a backstop, as I think I think you call them, to, to mm. put behind you. You've got that big base of support. So uh, on a rally out of the pullback at a stop somewhere in the base, I you know never it's never safe, but that would at least tell you you're wrong. Stop out and 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 go and find something else. I would think a lot of uh, the other cryptos probably have a similar setup. There, there, there's certainly some variety uh, for sure, but I'd love to bring up the chart of Bitcoin if I could uh, while we're sort of in that uh, on that topic, then we'll move on. Can you just update us because we, you know, clearly a big run higher. Bitcoin's now stalling out uh, right around 25,000. This is my chart we're looking at, of course. Yeah, yeah. What do you see? I mean, do you still see overall strength over weakness here? What are the key levels you're looking at on this particular chart? Well, the way I kind of feel about Bitcoin is it's it's like they're not going to make it easy on us, you know, and, <laughs> and, and because right when it feels easy, because you can see that last little, it looked like it was just going to roll over and the whole world began to just doubt it once again. And all the all the naysayers came out of the woodworks, woodwork, and then it went straight back up, you know, so yeah. it just fooled everybody. So I think now we're going to have to let it get above about 26,000 before getting too excited. Overall, I'm still bullish. I'm still bullish on crypto. The altcoins have been on fire lately, like I said a second ago. Uh, one during the trip was up like 100%. And I got whacked on a couple too, so I don't, I don't want to make it sound like they all work. But it, it's just amazing, and there's a lot of speculative money flowing in. Unfortunately, and this is something that uh, Greg Schnell brought up at Stock Charts in one of our debates, is that the crypto a lot of times seems like it's it's tethered to the S&P, especially like the Bitcoin. So we have to watch the Bitcoin. It's not like the old people. <laughs> but, <laughs> I am old. Uh, but anyway, we'll have to definitely watch that. And I think uh, the term you often use is risk on, risk off. And, and they both seem to be, and it's kind of a bummer because I was hoping that Bitcoin would be the the one that could just, you know, detach and you could trade that while stocks yeah. are going great and then flip back over. Yeah, at times I feel like there's been this great promise that they would be differentiated, that there'd be a lot of divergences. I feel like at, at the times when you really want them to diverge, they seem to move together, yeah. I guess, more than anything. <laughs> you know, so keeping with some speculative names, Tesla is a stock that's had a pretty good run off of the lows. I, a pretty good is probably a, a huge understatement. It's doubled off of the lows from the beginning of this year. If someone missed out on this move in Tesla, is it too late? What do you see on the chart and, and, and where do you see this thing going okay. from here? Many years ago, I I did stock picking or helped a, a day trader pick stocks, and he would look at this huge picture, this huge big picture technical analysis, and, and then kind of drill down to the day trade. And when I look at it in, in my own trading, I'm the swing trader, but I'm looking to stick with a position. I look for what could go wrong, and the problem with Tesla is you have a mountain of overhead supply mm. in the stock, just going way back. So. The way I do technical analysis, I'm just trying to read the mind of the market. And anybody who bought Tesla during that period is looking to get off the hook. And people, believe it or not, sell stocks while they're going up, especially if they, they've owned them prior. They, they're just looking to get out at break even. And so that's the way I see that big old mound. And it starts in uh, October, goes all the way back to last year. So that would concern me about Tesla, I think, as far as a day trade, maybe, on the upside, it looks pretty interesting. If it begins to roll over a little bit, it's volatile enough to where it, it, it could be in trouble if it began to roll over. Right now, I'm constructive, but I wouldn't I wouldn't take a position there just because that overhead supply. Even though it'd be a good problem to have if it rallied 30, 40 points into that overhead supply, I just kind of like to let everything have unlimited potential because mm. you know you're going to have losses along the way. So every now and then, you want to just hit one out the park and make a lot, a lot of money on it. We have less than a minute, but I did want to bring up semiconductors. We were talking before the show. He's mentioned this was one group that you were sort of constructive on. What do you like when you're looking at this? NVIDIA, by the way, reporting after the close day. Talk us through semiconductors quick, if you could. Yeah, I love semiconductors because they're kind of a barometer of the overall market. And the mm -hmm. fact that the semis are doing well in here makes me feel a little better about the market. So I pay a lot of attention to the semiconductors. Right now, so far, they just pull back. If they have a big sell-off from here, uh, back, back below, let's say, 220 or 226, Somewhere in that area, I begin to get a little nervous, but so far they still look bullish. We do have some overhead supply, but possibly on an individual issue basis, we could find some that don't have that overhead supply. So we could start seeing some setups and CBs really quick, but waiting for an entry might keep us out of trouble. If they keep selling off, then uh, no capital is put in harm's way. You've mentioned waiting for an entry a couple of times here, Dave. I think that's great guidance. I hope people are uh, are listening and they learn to be patient as well. Dave, listen, it's awesome to see you. Thanks for uh, being flexible coming on the show today. Stay safe and be well down there. And I uh, will talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Thank you.
That's Dave Landry. Dave's the founder of DaveLandry.com. Uh, approaches the the market with a with a focus on mindset and behavior, and also uh, the evidence in the market. So, so I love talking with Dave about uh, kind of anything and everything. If you mentioned, I, I, I mentioned that at the end. He, he mentioned a number of times being patient, right? Not just chasing things, but he mentioned being patient, waiting for the right opportunity. I feel like particularly newer traders love to just jump in and start doing something as if that is what's going to uh, create good returns for you, right? You're going to have a great you know, if you can just get in there and start taking action, remember that trading as a verb a lot of times means you're not taking action. You're waiting. You're waiting for an opportunity, waiting for the good pitches, as I tell my uh, my seven-year-old son uh, when we're playing uh, baseball. Great take there, as always, from Dave Landry. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here's chart number one. I'm so glad we got to look at the chart of uh, ARK Innovation Fund. We've mentioned in the market recap, uh, Dave, I, I thought Dave Lander had some really interesting uh, points. He was thinking about the run in these moves and also thinking about the exposure that a fund like this uh, has. He also mentioned the short ARK Fund, uh, SARK, and we had the uh, the manager, uh, Mike Tuttle, uh, on the show last year talking about uh, a number of different things, including that uh, overall uh, approach. What's interesting to me when you think about the overall market environment, feeling risk off here in the last week with the S&P drawing down, NASDAQ having a big down day uh, and, and a down week so far, you look at the ARK Innovation Fund, which is probably one of the best sort of measures of emerging technology, as, as I would sort of describe it, sort of in a consolidation phase. I, I think it's truly in a wait and see mode. What's easy about this sort of chart, and I remember John Bollinger years ago mentioning lowering volatility, right? A big move, and then you sort of settle down. This is when the Bollinger Bands kind of tighten up. And his comment was, these are the best charts because you know one way. It's going to break one way or the other. You know a break is coming. You wait. You see which way it goes. It also reminds me of all the uh, options traders we've had on the show, like Daniel Shea yesterday, Sean McLaughlin last week, uh, with some really good ways with the options market, of course, of, of playing this sort of consolidation phase and betting on a break in either direction. But I would be very keen to see which way this chart breaks. I think that could be an interesting confirmation in terms of what we're seeing with the broader indexes. Chart number two, while I see very much a risk on uh, risk off feel, you see the major averages struggling, you lot, see a lot of individual names, particularly previous leadership like energy and elsewhere, really struggling. Technology like Microsoft and Apple, those are pulling back after having a big run off, off of the lows. I'm looking at a series of ratios. One of the charts that popped up as something that was not breaking down was the copper to gold ratio. Now, there's a lot of nuance in this because there's a dollar impact that's going to impact what it, uh, this chart is telling you uh, and, uh, and a lot of other things. But I was always taught when copper is outperforming gold, overall, that means economic conditions are pretty good because that means people are growing things and they need raw materials to do stuff and they're not just getting defensive. When this ratio is going down, that means defense is outweighing offense and uh, basically there's not as much demand for those basic materials and there's more demand for a safe haven like gold. For what it's worth, this ratio has been going up. Now, it's been going up since July of last year. Probably one of those indicators that told uh, that, that I think looking back was a great indication that the bear phase that we saw through most of 2022 may be nearing its, uh, its end. For what it's worth, as the market's selling off, this ratio is actually moving to the upside. One of the rare bullish indications I'm seeing right now. That brings us to our last chart. We'll get it back to more of a, a, uh, a realistic assessment, I think, of the market environment. We've talked a lot about breadth over this week. I did a webcast yesterday talking about some breadth indicators. One that we didn't address in that webcast, but I wanted to highlight here was the bullish percent index for the NASDAQ 100. As a reminder, this is a breadth indicator based off of point and figure charts. When this line is above 70, that means seven out of 10 names in this group are in a bullish point and figure phase. I've highlighted with red bars, when it comes out of that 70% region, you can see that lines up with drawdowns in the NASDAQ 100 over the last 12 months. We just got one of those at the end of the first week in February. At this point, it's still suggesting risk off. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com joining us from New Orleans. All of our previous interviews are at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well. See you tomorrow.
guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.